samples of cremated remains in her office. And all of the remains were um, unidentified. And she, about four weeks ago, she find, that woman uh, just got arrested and Fran Grady Jahuli has been trying to find out if any of the remains are one of, of her son. And uh, there's a reporter down there um, who is with uh, ABC Orlando and he's also, his name is Adam Washer, and uh, he is also looking into Fran's situation. Uh, now the, the case has kind of expanded and uh, we're hoping to have uh, the Florida Attorney General, who is a woman, she just got elected, and uh, she seems to be uh, pretty thorough in her investigations. And we're trying to have her kind of pay attention to this guardianship in Florida. And uh, we also want to find Brad, who is Fran's son. And the thing is, is that different people call me from time to time and different people tell me about different cases that they want to be brought on the air. Uh, there's all sorts of guardianship cases. I got a call the other day and a man told me that they were doing a lot of building on Arthur Hayes' property at Hayes LLC down on the waterfront on Western Avenue and Alaska Way and all the uh, waterfront property near the, uh, the highway over, you know, the Magnolia Bridge. And uh, they wanted me to look into that, uh, that the permits aren't properly uh, received by Ni Michael Longyear and the contractors that he's gotten to do the building. And that may right require the Arthur Hayes family to tear down the buildings. And uh, I've also heard uh, from different people that want me to, to put on the air that um, the taxes on that estate and the taxes on the buildings that they're selling and the taxes on the homes that they're selling, those taxes might not be up to date. And then I was in Kirkland the other day and I was at the Kirkland Heritage Center and they're open two times a week. And they're open on Wednesday from like two to six, and they're open on Monday from like eight to one. And I was asked to look into the old log cabin that was in Kirkland uh, along the waterfront, and it used to be used for a medical center. And apparently there was a living trust involved with that log cabin. It was a historic log cabin. It was a medical office. It was existing in 2012. And then there were some land use issues that got done and the whole side of the road got changed with the new land use of 2013. And that building got demolished with a few other buildings and the heritage building is still there. But most of the other buildings that were on that street have been uh, removed and new buildings have been put in. So I have a client, a person who called up and they also want to know about what was the status of that log cabin? It was a landmark. It was a heritage landmark. It was there for the longest time and it was the oldest log cabin in Kirkland, but yet it got torn down during that new uh, land, years, land use memorandum that they did. And right now there's another land use situation happening uh, for the other side of the street. And I had another person call me up to find out uh, what other buildings on the other side of the street are going to be affected by it? And so from time to time people call me up about all sorts of things right now the topic is uh, devil drugs land use uh, historic buildings um, Basically people aren't interested in the city council or the mayor's office They're kind of interesting in the grassroots what's happening now and so I'd like you to call me up if you have a question or a comment, or if you want to sit right over there at that chair and be on my show. You know, I would love to interview you. I'd love to have people come in when I'm in here. Sometimes I'm in here on Wednesday and sometimes I'm in here on Thursday. So if you call me at 206-854-0375, which is me, sorry, it's me. I can make an arrangement for you to come down to this TV station and talk about your case. Now, I've been talking to a lot of people about UFOs, 
and the UFO group that meets uh, in Port Townsend once a month, at the end of the month. I think they meet at the last, the third Saturday of the month. And that's quite fascinating. And there's UFO seminars that happen. And um, Coast to Coast is always doing things on them. Uh, UFOs and so there's different people that call me from time to time on different topics uh, my show is called public interest issue show and I'm over here at the TV studio and I'm just trying to put my show on the air and I really can't think of what to put it on the air about today I'm, I'm interested in the fact that I left my office this morning and as I walked downtown one block away from my office I asked this guy who was leaning against a post, he was kind of out of it. I asked him, can I film you and ask you about drugs? And he said, yes, you can film me. And I filmed him and he talked to me as much as he could about his experience living on the streets in downtown Seattle and how hard it is for him. And then he ate a hot dog. And so, you know, he was surviving. And then these other people walked by who had a dog and they were homeless too, and they didn't want to be on camera, so I respected that, that they didn't want to be on camera. But they also told me that everybody knows about devil drugs and how it kills you, you can take it once. It's made by people just anywhere. There's no regulation on it. It's totally some uh, precocted thing that people just kind of make wherever they are. And uh, the guy that was walking by, walking his dog said, that everybody knows about uh, devil drugs, you know, and, and that's why I did my little film on devil drugs. It's shame the devil, kiss the world. That's my new film. And it's about devil drugs. It's about, you know, you, you take them and then you turn into a zombie. You never come back. Your mind just freezes. And so I would like some people on the air that can tell me more about the drug activity. Um, I know that the DEA used to have an office in downtown Seattle in the parking garage of US Bank on the second floor. And then they used to go out of the building through the alley instead of through First Avenue. And I know that when they used to investigate drug activity on First Avenue, because uh, somebody would put the drugs in the planter boxes and then the DEA would put cameras all over to see who that was. Um, I want to talk to you. I want to talk to whoever you are that wants to give me an interesting story to have on the air. Now, I'm sorry that this story today wasn't that interesting because you know, I really don't have anything to say because you guys haven't called me this week. The only person that called me this week was a cake store in Kent that just opened. And they had their grand opening and I went in there and ate a cupcake. But I, I want to do stories on really interesting things. So I want to talk to you and I appreciate it a lot. And uh, thank you for listening. Thanks for watching my show. You could have your show in here. This is Seattle Community Media TV. This is the studio. This is where the shows happen and we could talk to you. Now I want to find out information about Justice Charles Wiggins. If you have been in his courtroom and you think that something was a little odd about the case that you were involved in, I would like to have your story on the air. Now, my experience with Justice Wiggins is that he was involved in a case where they were fictitious tax returns and he pushed that the performa tax returns would be paid for uh, tax, tax on tax, tax on tax, which is fraud. And I brought it to his attention that his uh, recommendations were fraud and uh, he didn't do anything about it except for they threatened me. And so then in the Court of Appeals, uh, my case went up to the Washington State Supreme Court and Justice Wiggins was on the bench at that time. And I requested that Justice Wiggins not be involved in the case that I had before the Supreme Court of Washington because he had a conflict of interest and he was the one that declined the case. 
Now, Mr. Wiggins is not above the law, and he's a sitting judge. And I think that it's a travesty that he is on different committees. He's on like a budget committee, and he's on like a research committee, and he's on different committees. And I, I am very alarmed at this. And I'm, I'm very alarmed that there is absolutely no uh, backup investigation source to investigate uh, improper judicial conduct, like Nancy Bradburn Johnson. She's a court commissioner down in King County Court, and she held a hearing when the courthouse was closed because it was snowing outside, and all the courthouse was closed. The, the King County Sheriffs always have to be there because the judge's mailroom on the second floor is open. So the, the sheriffs downstairs told me, well, the courthouse is closed. I said, well, I'm just going up to the mailroom. Goes, okay, you can do it. I went up to the mailroom. I went to the Nancy Bradburn Johnson's courtroom. It was locked. So I knew that there should be no hearings happening. And then I come to find out that Jennifer Baharsky, who is an attorney with the Washington State Attorney General's office and Nancy Bradburn Johnson, who is a commissioner, held a hearing when the courthouse was closed. Now, I both think they have an obligation to report that to the Judicial Board and the Washington State Bar and the US, Washington State Supreme Court about that improper behavior. And I care about it because I care about legal ethics. But Nancy Bradburn Johnson has absolutely no business holding hearings when the courthouse is closed. And Jennifer Poharsky, she used to be a U.S. attorney, and now she works with the Attorney General's office in Washington, in, in Olympia. They have no business holding hearings while the courthouse is closed. These are the kind of things that people call me about and I investigate. Those two things I knew myself, and I put in a document with the court and the court still allowed Dan Smirkin to be the guardian of Robert Hamlin. So that case is very improper and I would like somebody to investigate it, but probably nobody will. But there's a lot of guardianship cases happening and there's a lot of judicial misconduct happening and Nancy Bradburn Johnson should be investigated and she should lose uh, her seat on the bench and she should be investigated for this. I think it's not just improper, I think it's illegal conduct. And Jennifer Poharsky, she should be investigating for having that meeting when the courthouse is closed. So thank you very much. Uh, Dan Smirkin diverted Avis Hamlin's mail. He just put in requests at all these financial institutions for Avis and Robert Hamlin's mail to be forwarded to Olympia. Well, Avis doesn't live in Olympia. So when the mail got forwarded to Olympia for five years, her mail got diverted. And Dan Smirkin is still getting mail down there. And isn't that mail fraud or tampering or, or identity theft or some type of illegal conversion? But nobody seems to care. And Michael Longyear, he's charged over $500,000 in legal fees to Michael Longyear has charged that to Arthur Hayes. And Michael Longyear is the, is the guardian of the estate and he's the member and the manager of Hayes LLC. So those are the kind of things that people call me about. And those are the kind of things I don't wanna just tell you about. I want you to sit right there and tell me. Thank you very much. And I wanna say thank you, thank you, thank you to Marty Oakley, PPJ Gazette, because she's doing wonderful work out there. So thank you for watching. This is the Public Interest Issue Show, Seattle Community Media TV. We're here in Seattle, and we're nationwide on the internet. Thank you. Just go to seattlecommunitymedia.org. Thank you. Goodbye. See you next week. Thank you very much. I think I got everything on my nose.